It's a good day to be a Christian, isn't it, brother? Amen. Amen. It's a good day to be a member of the church that you read about in the New Testament. Very few in our land, in our community, in our neighborhoods can say that. I want tonight to talk about Christian unity. What is unity? Webster says it is the state or condition of being one. Our world, politically and socially, and even religiously, longs to be united. That's why we have the United States of America. The 13 regional colonies became eventually 50 states. We have the United Nations, for good or ill. It wants to be united. True Christian unity, though, is lacking in this world and often even in the Lord's church. Think about it, folks. Where is the unity of the early church? They were united. Acts 2, verse 42, church there in Jerusalem, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. That breaking of bread wasn't a potluck supper. That was the Lord's Supper. They were united. But you know, they as we must constantly work at that goal of being united. Because the devil is always there to cause problems. First Peter 5 verse 8, he goeth about it as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And he wants to devour Christians. He wants to devour the church. That's why we have false doctrine rather than true doctrine, sound doctrine. That's why we have denominations, religious confusion, rather than unity. That's why we have false teachers rather than godly teachers such as Brother Daniel. Where is the unity of what some call the restoration movement? Oh, by the way, I'm not a member of any movement, and you aren't either. I'm a Christian. But many people talk about the restoration movement of the 19th centuries, and there was a time when men and women began to go back to the Bible and say, let's do Bible things and Bible ways. Let's call Bible things by Bible names and so forth. And it was amazing. I've never seen anything like that in my life. Maybe you have. Where the gospel spread like a prairie fire. I used to live in the prairie. And I've seen prairie fires. It's an amazing thing. Just, just swept across this nation. Thousands were baptized. But all that was shattered within about two or three generations by religious liberalism and modernism. It shattered it. That great quest, that goal of unity. Where is the unity of the church that I witnessed as a young man in the 1960s and the early 1970s and some of you maybe even back in the 50s where men and women, Christians, had a love for the truth. A love of their brethren. And a fire for evangelism. I remember hearing young men come down from the old Sunset School of Preaching in Lubbock, Texas. And they were on fire to go and spread the gospel. This is back in the 1960s and 70s. The longing to do God's will, to go back to the Bible. What's happened to all that? Many places have been, been gutted by religious liberalism, worldliness, and all of that re come results in disappointment. That's really what comes down to disappointment. Because of dis disunity, we today see the tragic effect of disunity. You know what that is? It's unbelief. Unbelief is sweeping this country. It's already swept it. There's a decline in the belief in the authority of the Bible and society and the church. There's apathy and false doctrine in the church. That results, all results, eventually into unbelief. There's an invasion of Eastern religions, New Age movement, cults, Islam, Hinduism. Hosea 4, verse 6, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. They don't know the Bible. 
Our world does not know the Bible, and our brethren, in many cases, do not know the Bible. So let's tonight talk about religious unity. Whenever you, Christian unity, whenever you talk about this, you need to look at the antithesis of that. And that is the world's vision of religious unity. And for that, you go to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 11. An account that we often forget about, not long after Noah and his family had left the ark, and God says, you go forth and multiply and replenish the earth. They didn't obey that commandment as they should. They decided to congregate in one place together. And, and what happened within a generation or two? And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Let us make us a name. Let us be, lest we be scared abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Oh, we're going to be disunity. Disunite if we sp spread and do what God said to do. Go and replenish the earth. Let's all stay in one place and build a big tower and be united. Today, the religious world has a similar view. It's called unity and diversity. Fancy word for that is religious pluralism. Ecumenism, or ecumenicalism, some call it. That's a big word that means disorganized. You, you accept what someone else says is the truth. There is no spiritual truth. It says, well, it exists in many forms. Your truth is not my truth, people will say. It doesn't work in the area of religion. It never has. 1948, some well-meaning people, religious people in the United States, got together and formed the American Council of Churches. Not long after that, they formed the World Council of Churches. Oh, let's all, if we could all just sit around a table and agree to disagree and all commune together and be united, even though they were polar opposites in many cases. Well, well if you, you read about the World Council of Churches, not much to read about today. But this... Unity and diversity also rejects absolutes. As Brother Danny quoted in his sermon this morning, John 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the, the life, T-H-E. No man come to the Father except by me. The means absolutely nothing else. He is those things. Mark 16, verse 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned or damned. That's about as absolute as you get. Religious unity and diversity says it doesn't matter what you believe. You're absolute. All that, that There's no such thing as absolutes. And it results in compromise and man-made union, and that's what the World Council of Churches is, rather than true Christian unity. Well, what did Paul say about that? You know, if they were surrounded, Paul... Uh, and for example, in Corinth, I was going to quote here 2 Corinthians 6, verse 4, where Paul was well, surrounded by all these different religious groups, pagans mainly, also the Jews, as well as the church. And he says, oh, go unite with those people. No, he said, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? The answer is none. Ephesians 5.11 and he was talking about all the horrible things the Gentiles did. The degeneracy among the Gentile society, much as we have today. He said, said, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, rather reprove them. Unity and diversity tolerates sin and false doctrine. They'll say, oh, you have your faith tradition. I have my faith tradition. Oh, we can all just respect one another and all just sit around the campfire and be nice. You know, Jesus never tolerated sin. He never tolerated false doctrine. Revelation 2, verse 10, the Lord spoke to the church at Thyatira. He said, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, that thou sufferest, that means you put up with, Thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things offered to idols. You put up with her. You tolerate her. And you shouldn't. 
we should not fellowship error. In 2 John, the book of 2 John, the only chapter in my computer or my, one of my Bible programs, you punch in 2 John and won't, you won't go anywhere. You have to put 2 John 1 in there for <laughs> There's only one chapter in 2 John. But anyway, that's that. 9 through 11, you know this passage. Whosoever, there, whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come unto you any, let me read that again. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house. Don't be united with him. In other words, neither bid him Godspeed. Don't keep him on his journey. Keep him going. Don't help him. He that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. But then he spoke of this this morning on his radio program. Don't tolerate false doctrine. Paul said in Galatians 5 verse 9, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Just a little speck of leaven will raise that dough. A little bit of false doctrine will mess it all up. A little mud in the water makes it undrinkable. But you know, the world also has this idea about unity and man-made rules and traditions. You don't see quite as much emphasis on this as you used to, but it's still there. You have the Methodist discipline. And some of those, those rules are rather interesting. And some of them aren't. You have the Baptist handbook. You have the Catholic catechism. The Episcopalian Book of Common Prayer. The Mor Book of Mormon and the corresponding doctrines and covenant that go with that. You have creeds, confessions of faith, and on and on. You don't need any of that. You already have the Bible. Proverbs 30, verse 5 and 6, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Add thou not unto His words, lest thou be reproved, and thou be found a liar. So when someone comes along and says, well, the Bible, yes, it's fine, wonderful, but we need this, that, this, this addition here. They are a liar. Because they are trying to add to His Word. You know, well-meaning people always try to find a way to help God out. Kind of like Abraham and Sarah did with Hagar. But they do it with their rules and traditions. Oh, well, I know the Bible says this, but we'll, we'll add this, this creed here or this, this rule. Jesus came across this in his day. He was, it, Judaism, ancient Judaism was full of tradition that wasn't found in the law of Moses. And he met some of that wouldn't wash their hands the way they were supposed to. He was supposed to before he ate. And he said in Matthew, in Mark 7, verse 7, How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines and commandments of men. And notice verse 13. That same comment, part of that same comment. He says, Making the word of God of none effect through their tradition which ye have delivered, and many such like things ye do. You made a word of God useless of no effect when you start adding to it. And what's amazing to me is these people that have these disciplines and these handbooks and these creeds and confessions and books, they turn around and they fight among themselves about those very rules. You can look at the Episcopal Church. A lot of the battle is already done, but a couple of years ago they had a knock-down drag-out about the ordination of women and also about the uh, homosexual bishops until they finally got, got some. You can look at the Presbyterian Church. And there's a couple of different Presbyterian groups. The United Presbyterians had another knockdown drag out about the same thing. And finally, they now have agreed about homosexual clergy, as they call it. All fights about rules, which they could have gone to the Bible in many various places in the New Testament and found out that was, that was wrong. But, oh no, 
they have to have something else besides the Bible. And what does it do? It makes the Word of God of none effect. Mark 7, verse 13. But also, the religious world's view of unity is unity around unauthorized authority. You know, human condition is everyone in human society is everyone wants to follow a leader. That's why many denominations are dominated by the pastor system. They'll have a church, a local body that is dominated by their, their preacher. He calls the shots. I remember a little town I grew up in. man came in and in this denomination, and he, uh, a very talented fellow, could play the guitar and sing, and boy, he was real charming, and oh, and pretty soon, it was actually the, the Second Baptist Church, that was what it was called. Pretty soon it got bigger than the First Baptist Church. And it was big, and then all of a sudden it was found out he wasn't what he seemed to be. And he ran off with the church secretary, as I recall. And all of a sudden that whole thing just collapsed. Well, that's sad. It's not really funny. It's sad. It shows us when you try to follow a leader, if you have a pastor or you have a board of deacons, you have the pope, you have this, a synod, a president of the church, a council, a bishops that are not the, the bishops like you read about in the New Testament. Some man trying to control, organization trying to control the body of Christ. Reminds me of what, what uh, told Samuel in 1 Samuel 8, verse 5, when they, they said, make us a king to judge us like all the nations. We want a leader like all the nations. And God says, I'm your leader. <laughs> and they wouldn't accept that. That aside, well, Jesus is the leader of the church. He's the head of the church. Colossians 1, verse 18, the head of the body. You can read about that in the Bible. I'm not the head of the church. No one else is. He is authorized through the Bible that church affairs be handled by the men of the congregation. Elders, or the men, the, the men of the congregation that meet together, some call it business meeting, all following what the New Testament says. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 40, why? Let all things be done decently and in order. And that decently, decency and decently in order is based on the Word of God. Not what I think, what you think, my opinion, your opinion, based on what God says. So that's the way the world uses unity. Now let's look at the Bible's blueprint for unity. The Bible's blueprint of unity is centered, of course, around the Word of God, but also the brotherhood of believers. We are all Christians. We are different than the world. I remember the tragic story about Lot in Genesis chapter 13, where Lot, he, he was, of course, left uh, Ur along with, um, actually, Haran, along with Abraham and Sarah and their flocks and herds. And as God blessed Abraham, he blessed Lot too. And, one, and finally their, their, their herds and flocks and herds got so big they could not <coughs> stay with, you, with each other. So Abraham says, told his, his nephew, Lot, you take what you want. And said, for we be brethren. We be brave. And Abraham was going to take the lesser. And he turned out he took the better. Lot chose the fertile plains of, of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain. And we know what happened there. All New Testament Christians are brethren and should strive to be in agreement. Brotherhood of believers. Amos 3, verse 3, can two walk together except they be agreed? Of course not. They agree. The basis of that unity, brethren, is the unity of the gospel. Over in Ephesians chapter 4, Apostle Paul penned these words, he and the Holy Spirit. It says in verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, as you were, you were called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. That's unity. One unity. Yet the world looks at what they call Christianity, 
They see anything but that. A number of years ago, I worked in a laboratory one summer when I was in college. There was a couple of young men that came over from Algeria. Algeria is a Muslim country. Training in that laboratory, nice young men. And they told us, uh, the company I work for says, don't talk about religion or politics. Well, guess what we talked about <laughs> in politics occasionally? And they'd say, uh, in their accent, they'd say, uh, I, I finally got around that I was a Christian. And they said, well, what about all these different churches out here? What about all that? Why, why are you, how can you say that when there's all this? They didn't say division, but that's what they meant. I remind them that Islam is divided too. Shia, Sunni, and several other groups. But that aside, they noticed that because the world looks at that too. In God's loving kindness, He gave us a pattern, a rule book, a blueprint to follow. What is that? The New Testament. John 8, verse 31, 32, If you abide in My Word, Jesus said, you are truly My disciples, and you shall know, K-N-O-W, the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Philippians 3, verse 16, Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 15, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught whether by word or our epistle. When we depart from that pattern, we do it at our own peril. Matthew 7, verse 21, Not all that say to me, Lord, Lord, shall know the King of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. The Bible tells us that Christian unity depends on being this, of the same mind. That doesn't mean we're robots. But notice in our text tonight, Romans 12, verse 16, be of the same mind toward one another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Why? Because of what Christ has done for me. I must do this for Christ. That's really what that comes into. Christ gave His life so I might be united, shed His blood, and I'd be one with Him and the brethren and the Father and the Holy Spirit. Mutual love and respect for one another. As Christ loved us, let us love one another. Humility. Don't try to dominate others. That's part of Christian, Christian unity too. It's recognition that Christ and His Word are in control. But Christian unity, that blueprint involves the, the important principle also of submission. Mutual submission or subjection to each other and to Christ. Matthew 19, verse 30, talking about the kingdom. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. There's no hierarchy in the kingdom of Christ. Philippians 2, verse 3, Let nothing be done through strife and vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem each other better than themselves. 1 Peter 5, verse 5, Yea, all of you be subject to one another and be clothed with humility for God Resist the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Now, that's Christian unity. Well, what about the enemies of Christianity? Well, we bang it. Of course, the main enemy is the devil. But the enemy, enemy of Christian unity, one of the main enemies, is compromising the truth of God's Word. And to this, I think the best example I know of is found over in, or one of the best examples, is in 1 Kings chapter 22. You know the story. King Ahab and King Jehoshaphat. God had divided up the kingdom of Israel, ancient Israel, into two parts after the death of Solomon. The northern kingdom went off into idolatry. The southern kingdom tried to kind of move around to be faithful. And it says here in verse 1, just read quickly here. It says, And they continued three years without war between Syria and Israel. It came to pass the third year that Jehoshaphat, he was the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel, and the king of Israel said unto him, king of Israel was Ahab, Know ye that Ramoth Gilead is ours? And we be still, and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria? And he, uh, he saith unto Je Jehoshaphat, Wilt thou go to me with a battle to Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. 
but also add uh, other places that Jehoshaphat's son, Jehoram, had married Ahab's daughter of Athaliah. That's a good name for a child, isn't it? Athaliah. And so here they were, intermarried, two opposite. Jehoshaphat was a righteous man. Ahab was anything but. What happens? They meet together. Oh, well, what's my, my people are your people. My horse are your horses. Let's go to battle against these evil Syrians. God didn't want that. Micaiah, one of the bravest prophets of the Old Testament, stood up and said, no. Told King Jehoshaphat, what are you doing here? <laughs> Why are you doing this? Jehoshaphat went ahead with it anyway, went into battle. Ahab died in his chariot. Jehoshaphat barely escaped death and went back to Jerusalem. When you compromise the truth of God's Word, you always end up in trouble. But also another enemy of Christian unity is the contention in the church. A good example of this is the church of Christ in Corinth in the first century. First Corinthians 1, verse 10 through 12 tells us that, mentions this set about this. For Paul says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the mercy of God, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. There be no divisions among you, but they be perfectly joined together in the same mind, the same judgment. Why, Paul? For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them that are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you, quarrels. Now this I say that every one of you saith, I'm a Paul, or I'm a Paulus, I'm a Cephas, I'm a Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul baptized for you? Crucified for you, pardon me. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? The church of Corinth was divided over men. Matters of pride and personalities. The focus should have been on Christ and not upon men. The picture of Christian unity is found here in verse 10. Speak the same thing. No divisions. Same mind. Same judgment. Not mindless robots, but servants of Christ and servants of each other. Perfectly joined together, he says in verse 10. You know what that word means? That phrase is talking about mending a fishing net. You know how a net has holes that are interlocked together? That's the way Christianity should be. When we go against all this, we undermine the work of the church and we shatter that unity. Luke 11, verse 23, He that is not with me is against me. Jesus said, He that gathereth not with me scattereth. Let's look briefly tonight at the Lord's vision of unity. You know, all through the Lord's ministry, He was aiming at Calvary, but He was also aiming to establish His church and bring all of His followers into fellowship with Himself, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit through the Gospel. And He prayed this up in that upper room in John chapter 17. And out of His betrayal, He said, praying to God, He says, Neither pray I for these alone, these apostles that believed in Him, but for them also which shall believe on, on Me through their word, that's you and I, that they may be one as Thou, Father, art in Me and I in Thee, that they also may be one in Us, that the world may believe that Thou hast sent Me. See, no room for unbelief there. Christian unity. The unity was to be a sign to all the church was in fellowship with the Godhead. Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We share, brethren, today. We're Christians. Share that blessed fellowship. Communion that Jesus enjoys with the Father. We have that too. This is why religious division, especially denominationalism, which is really institutionalized division, is such a great, great evil. It makes, brings about unbelief. As my Arab friends said so many years ago, in essence they were saying, you know, you claim you're united, you're a Christian, but what about all this division? That shows you're not united. John 10, verse 16. Jesus said, Another sheep I have, talking about the Gentiles, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. That's why, brethren, 
disunity and discord, contention in the church is such a terrible, terrible sin. Because it reflects on the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and the fellowship and communion we have with them. The unity. Now how do we maintain unity? You know unity should be the work of every Christian. The early church grew steadfastly, steadily during the first century. Why? Because they had miraculous gifts? Is that it? You know. The real reason was not because of a lack of persecution. They were persecuted from the beginning. Not because of lack of internal problems. They had false teachers not from the very beginning, but not long after that. Not because, but because they had the truth. They had the Gospel of Jesus Christ, and they realized that. They had a love for the truth and a love of each other. Because their eyes were not focused on this world, their eyes were focused on Jesus and His Word. That's why some of the epistles end with the Greek term Maranatha. Jesus is Lord. I'm not Lord. You're not Lord, but Jesus is Lord. Looking to Jesus, Hebrews 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, sat down at the right hand of the Father. And brethren, we can sit down with Him. If you're united with Him. To maintain the unity of the Lord requires we must restore that same mutual love and dedication in our life. I remember my grandmother Langley was a devout, wonderful Christian lady, a servant of Christ. And she would often talk about the truth. The truth. And that's what we need to talk about too. Brethren, do we have that vision working in our hearts today? If we did, we would grow. And God would give the increase. Maybe there's someone here tonight or someone listening that has not obeyed the Gospel of Christ, been united with Christ. How do you do that? The Bible tells us you need to believe in Jesus as, as God's Son. John 8, verse 24. You need to repent of your sins. Acts 17, verse 30. You need to confess the Christ as the Son of God, Romans 10, verse 9 and 10, be baptized for remission of sins, united with Christ in that watery grave to rise up to walk in newness of life. And that newness of life is unity with God and with your brother in His one church. That is your need tonight. Please come as we stand in sight. <clears throat> Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved